We're here. The final window people have been counting down to for months is no longer coming. It's happening. Today is December 19th, and 3 Atlas has reached its closest point to Earth. This is the moment where the geometry is cleanest, the tracking is sharpest, and the world's instruments have their best chance to squeeze real answers out of a visitor that does not belong to our solar system. For the last few months, we've watched this object slide across the sky like a quiet rumor. Always present, always moving, always just far enough away that everything about it could be debated. But a closest approach is different. It compresses uncertainty. It forces the question into a tight space. What are we actually looking at? Right now, 3i Atlas is still incredibly distant in human terms. We're not talking about anything near Earth in the everyday sense, but in astronomical terms. This is the closest geometry we get during the entire passage, close enough for our most sensitive instruments to do more than just see a dot, close enough to measure the coma, track gas loss, estimate dust size distribution, and observe how the tail behaves under the push and pull of solar wind. This is why so many telescopes are pointed at it at once. Hundreds of ground-based instruments, space telescopes, time booked across observation windows that are normally impossible to secure. And the reason is simple. Interstellar visitors are rare. They do not arrive on our schedule. They do not return on demand. If you miss the window, you don't get a redo. And what's made 3E Atlas even more compelling is that it hasn't behaved like a boring textbook object. Even people who strongly favor natural explanations admits that it has been unusually interesting, not because it breaks physics, but because it keeps forcing the same conversation over and over. Is it simply an interstellar comet with unusual characteristics, or are we misreading something fundamental about what it is? That conversation is exactly why this closest approach day matters so much, because today, the best images come in, the best spectra come in, the best time series data comes in, and the theories either become less necessary or more unavoidable. If you followed this from early on, you've probably watched multiple live streams. The Virtual Telescope Project, independent astronomers doing real-time tracking, people sitting up through the night, watching a faint target crawl across the background stars in real time. And one reason these streams matter is that they create a public record. When something is recorded live by many observers, it becomes harder for any single narrative to dominate. The sky becomes the reference. There's also something else that's happened during this entire buildup. The rise of independent observers as trusted sources of continuity. A lot of viewers notice that while major agencies often publish slowly, cautiously, and sometimes with minimal commentary, independent astronomers can move faster. They share raw views, explain what they're seeing in plain language, and keep the public engaged. One name that comes up repeatedly in this community is Ray's astrophotography, partly because he has stayed consistent in covering the object, night after night, and partly because in moments where official updates felt slow, his stream became the place people checked first. That doesn't mean independent observers replace science. It means they help the public stay connected to it. And today, that connection matters because this is when you can actually feel how real the event is. When you watch a live view and see an object move relative to stars in minutes, it stops being an idea and becomes motion. A traveler, a physical thing crossing our sky. Now let's talk about what has been driving the unease in some corners of the community. The anomalies, the long list of behaviors people keep repeating. First, a reminder. Anomalous does not mean artificial. Anomalous means not neatly explained yet, or unusual compared to what we expected. Nature produces strange things all the time. In fact, some of the most important scientific breakthroughs began as anomalies that later became normal once we understood the mechanism. But there are a few features that keep returning in discussions of 3i Atlas, and they're worth laying out carefully, without exaggeration. One of the biggest is tail geometry, specifically the anti-tail and sunward features people keep describing. Normally, comet tails point away from the sun because the solar wind and radiation pressure push dust and gas outward. When you see a tail that appears to point toward the sun, it feels wrong. But in most cases, an anti-tail is a viewing angle effect. It's dust in the orbital plane seen edge on, making a structure look like it's pointing sunward. The key word here is appears. It's not necessarily a violation of physics. It can be perspective, but the reason it still matters is because it tells us about particle sizes and distribution. Heavier dust behaves differently than lighter dust. If 3i Atlas is producing a dust population that makes these features unusually sharp or persistent, that is information. Then there's 
the coma chemistry, observers have reported a greenish hue at times, and in comet science, green glow is often associated with carbon-bearing molecules fluorescing under sunlight. If spectra confirms strong carbon chemistry, that doesn't mean anything mystical. It means the object may be rich in organic precursors. It tells us about where it formed and what temperature environment it lived in before it ever came here. And that part is actually one of the most exciting natural explanations, because an interstellar comet is like a message bottle. It carries chemical history from another disk, another star, another formation environment. Even if it's just a natural body, it's a sample of a place we will never visit. Now, some people have gone further and argued the motion and trajectory behavior of 3i Atlas has shown deviations that feel hard to model. It's important to be careful here. Small modeling differences can come from non-gravitational forces like outgassing. When a comet vents material, it can create tiny thrust effects that slightly alter its path. Those changes can look like course corrections if you don't account for them properly, or if the outgassing pattern changes rapidly. So if you see talk online about sudden shifts or unexpected deflections, the most grounded approach is to treat it as a question of modeling and forces, not a conclusion. But the reason these claims stick is because they match the emotional shape of the story. A traveler arrives. It behaves oddly. It approaches. People want it to be more than a rock. And in the absence of a clean, simple explanation that satisfies everyone, the mind fills in the gap. That's not a flaw. It's human. Another repeated point is alignment. The idea that certain features appear unusually stable or oriented in ways that feel statistically rare. Again, the correct response isn't to jump to intention. It's to ask what physical mechanism could create stability. Does the nucleus have a particular shape? Does it have jets venting in a preferred direction? Does it rotate slowly or in a way that creates consistent outgassing? Does the geometry make the same feature look aligned from our perspective? We have to remember that even a normal comet can look designed if you catch it under the right conditions. Then there are the signal claims, electromagnetic emissions, patterns, strange pulses, anything that sounds like communication. This is where it's especially important to keep your footing. Space is noisy. Instruments pick up interference. Solar wind changes. Background sources fluctuate. And humans are pattern finders. We see structure everywhere, especially when we want a narrative. That said, Electromagnetic measurements can still be valuable. If an object interacts with solar wind, it can produce detectable signatures. If a coma is shedding material, it can create measurable effects. None of that requires technology. It only requires plasma physics and chemistry. So how do we hold this story in a way that keeps it honest, still compelling? We do it by staying loyal to the moment we're in, because today is the moment the best data arrives. Today is when you don't have to argue based on low resolution guesses. Today is when the spectrum gets clearer, when the coma changes can be tracked hour by hour, when tail geometry can be measured from multiple instruments, when images from different locations can be compared. And if you're watching this right now, you are watching something rare in human terms, an interstellar object, a body that formed around another star, coming close enough for humanities instruments to study it in detail. That alone is historic. Even if every anomaly ends up having a natural explanation, it remains an extraordinary scientific opportunity. Now let's talk about the psychological weight of this moment, because it's real. A lot of people are feeling wonder, but a lot of people are also feeling unease. And that unease doesn't come from the object itself. The object is not coming to Earth. It's not impacting. It's not threatening the planet. The unease comes from the implications, from the feeling of a visitor, from the reminder that the solar system is not sealed, that the space between stars is not empty, that things can arrive from outside, cross our neighborhood, and leave again. And there's something quietly humbling about that, because it reminds us of scale. It reminds us that our entire civilization is a thin layer on one planet. And beyond that is an environment so vast that even a close approach is still hundreds of millions of kilometers away. So today, I want you to approach this in the best way possible. Watch, but don't rush to certainty. If you love the natural explanation, don't force every anomaly to be nothing. Let the data speak. If you love the extraordinary explanation, don't force every anomaly to be proof. Let the data speak. The real story, the one worth keeping, is what survives measurement. Over the next hours, we're going to see more images, more spectroscopic breakdowns, more observational summaries. And when those arrive, you'll notice something interesting. Some theories will dissolve on contact. Others will sharpen. Not because someone believes harder, 
but because reality has a way of filtering stories. And after today, the event begins to move away from us. The closest approach passes, the geometry changes, the object recedes, and eventually, 3i Atlas becomes harder to track, and the world moves on to the next story. But the data collected today does not disappear. Scientists will study it for years, because this object is a physical fragment of another system's formation history. It's a sample from a place we can't reach, a clue about the chemistry of other protoplanetary disks, a hint about how common certain compounds might be across the galaxy. And that's the part people forget when the debates get loud. Even the boring explanation is still mind-blowing. A comet from another star system came through our solar system, and we caught it with our instruments. We measured it, we recorded it, we added it to human knowledge. That is not small. So as we move through the final hours of this closest approach day, I want to ask you something simple. Where are you watching from? Are you following through live streams, telescope feeds, and updates? Are you observing yourself? Did you stay up late, waiting for that faint smudge to slide past the stars? And what part of this story has gripped you the most? The tail geometry, the chemistry, the speed, or the simple fact that this thing is not from here? Drop your thoughts below. I read more than you think, especially during nights like this. And as soon as the clearest, closest approach images and data summaries start to circulate, I'll come back with the next update. Not to hype it, not to force an angle, but to show you what the sky actually gave us. Because today is the moment. Clear skies.